Galloway's Alison Robinson from Blind Veterans UK. So Lancashire and Cumbria comes under Region 1. But just to give you an idea of the area, Region 1 covers Scotland, Northern Ireland, Lancashire and Cumbria, Greater Manchester and Merseyside, North Wales and Cheshire. So we're sort of all one team, Region 1, but we're split up into the communities. So as a community support worker, we are all home based. So being at home isn't massively unusual. However, we're not used to being at home five days a week. We probably spend one day a week at home and then the rest of the week out in the community um, with our members. Um, before I joined Malign Veterans, I did work in a sensory team within local authority. So I've worked around vision loss and hearing loss for a number of years. Um, although we are home based, we do have a regional office um, for our community and that's based in Liverpool. So often we'll pop in there for meetings and, to, you know, administration, picking up paperwork, that sort of thing. Um, so blind veterans, who are we? Well, we was established in 1915 by a chap called Sir Arthur Pearson, who um, was witnessing... Um, Squad is coming back from the First World War with vision loss, I think mainly from sort of like mustard gas um, issues. And he decided he wanted to do something about it and to, to help them. So he, he established a first sort of hostel um, for those chaps coming back with, with vision loss. And the premises that he used was called St Dunstan's Lodge. So we were originally known as St Dunstan's, people may have heard that before, I'm not sure. And it was only sort of like in the last, I think, 10 to 15 years, we changed to blind veterans, because I think that says more about who we are and who we support. Um, and one of the first things that he did, Sir Arthur Pearson, was to issue um, people with a braille watch. So that it sort of like signifies what how we started and puts in rehabilitation at the heart of what we do. Um, in terms of becoming a member, um, we take anybody that's served and that can be national service and uh, who has vision loss. A lot of people will usually ask us, well, what sort of vision loss do you, do you have to have? Um, Broadly, you have to be um, certified as severely sight impaired or the old definition of blind. But that is just a very broad statement because we do have people within the organisation, members that are partially sighted, but it all depends on what your field losses are. And you guys all, all, all understand all about that and the ophthalmology and optometry terms. So we always say to people, if in doubt, please apply, you know, if you've, if you've you fulfill the criteria that you've served in the armed forces and you've got any sort of vision loss then apply um, and our own optometrists or your own optometrist can do a report and tell us about your field losses and that might mean that you'd get accepted within the charity which is great the more the merrier we want you all on board um, you may have heard that we've got a couple of centres. We have, we've got one in Wales, and I have to say this right because I always say it wrong, Clandidno, and we have one in Brighton. And um, we also have a head office in London as well. We did used to have a centre in Sheffield, um, but that's not a centre now for members. It's, it's more a centre for equipment and support services. Um, so both our centres have a care facility to them. Um, at Brighton, we have some permanent residents who are visually impaired and they live in. Um, Landlord, no, we don't have any permanent residents, but people do go in for a respite or for training or just for a holiday. And all sorts of activities are run from our centres. Um, and as I say, they have a, a care arm as well. So activities such as arts and crafts, woodwork, um, technology sessions, um, vast range of things really. Um, I think we have the car at Brighton, so people who are visually impaired can have a go at driving again. Um, they have tandem biking, mountaineering, canoeing. It's all sort of like pretty endless really. Lots and lots of activities on. 
Um, during COVID, obviously, our response, like most organisations, has had to change. Um, in the community, we would normally be going out and visiting people and offering services within the community um, and rehabilitation. We've not been able to do that. We've not been able to visit. Um, so our initial response was to do safe and well calls, make sure that people were okay. We have done some critical visits. We've helped people out with shopping and getting medication, that sort of thing. And then because we knew it was going to be a bit longer than a couple of months, <laughs> we've had to try to fill the gap as best we can. Um, so we've got um, a national creative project that's, that's ongoing with our members. Um, and I think at the moment, I just looked up to see what we were doing. Um, we've got like um, a, a gardening project. So it's growing sweet peas on the, on the windowsill. Um, we've also got remote rehabilitation. So when you hear this word remote, it means it's over the phone or it's over something like we're doing now, where um, if somebody needs a piece of equipment or they need assessing for low vision, we're trying to do that remotely. And it's working out quite well, really. Um, so that could be anything from providing a magnifier uh, to doing some cooking skills with somebody remotely. The only thing that we can't do is mobility and long cane training because that's something that's got to be done face to face. Um, what else can I tell you about us? The service is under review at the moment. They're taking the opportunity to review what offer um, that we provide once we're able to go out and visit again. So we're all still waiting to find out what that's going to look like. At the moment, what would happen is if you're accepted as a member, um, membership services deal with all that, and then you're allocated to your community team. And then a member of the team like myself would contact you and arrange to come out and visit you. Um, and we do a bit a, a full sort of assessment around your needs and what's priority for you. And then we work with you to try and fulfill those needs. And then we would offer you a week at one of our centres. It's called an introduction week. It tells you all about what we do as a charity, another opportunity to sort of get hands on with equipment. Um, we also do a session with partners and carers. Um, unfortunately, we've not been able to do that either because the centres aren't open. Uh, but we have been doing those remotely as well. So we've been doing them, you know, it's a little bit like a living with sight loss course, uh, that sort of area. And we've been doing those um, online remotely as well. Um, we have around just over 4,000 members at the moment, but as I say, they're, they're spread right across the country um, from Scotland, Northern Ireland, down to lovely Cornish villages in the Southwest. Um, so any questions around that? Is there anything else I can tell you about us? Uh, the, the question I wanted, the real question I wanted to ask you, I noticed, and I'm all, I've been to one of your centres down on the south coast because we used you a swimming pool when i was on the torch trust for the blind holiday yeah. uh, once at hurst pier point and uh, we uh, came to to your center at brighton and used the pool and uh, it's a, a lovely place but one thing that crosses my mind and when people lose particularly those who lose their sight later in life it's a bit daunting isn't it, for some people to come all that way on the train uh, or whatever, because they're not. Um, it's not like people coming to Galloway's where it might just be a local journey or a short journey across Lancashire, you know, where somebody could perhaps take them if they've not got the skills to use public transport or don't want to, be, don't know about journey care, you know. Uh, yeah, take that on board. But we do provide transport. Um, so we would expect that if you lived in sort of the south of the country, that you would go to the Brighton Centre and then anywhere, yeah. you know, north, you would go to Plandidno. Um, and yeah. we, we have transport. So we have vans and cars and transport drivers who actually pick, pick up. If you're not able to get there by your own means, then we can pick you up and bring you to the centres. So that, that does happen now. I think people's first visits to our centres is usually the intro week. So they're at the yeah. beginning of their, of their sight loss journey 
And so we do a lot of work with them around sort of psychological side of sight loss and, and yeah. building confidence. And then a big thing within the organisation is so the camaraderie that they have, you know, between the services. Yeah. Um, so it's a good opportunity to, you know, make friends and connections. And, you know, we have a bar area. That's always a winner um, when, when we can uh, relax in the bar in the evening. Basically, um, what is the, the actual criteria? I did apply um, about three, three or four years ago uh, and was told basically my site wasn't bad enough. They did contact me last year, but because of the pandemic, it got held up. But in fact, in the last month, my optician has put a, has filled in one of the forms that they've sent out. So I'm waiting for a, a response from that. All right, okay. Well, so so going back to um, what I was saying originally was as a, as a broad sort of uh, criteria, it's severely sight impaired. However, it's dependent on your field losses because we do have people um, accepted who are partially sighted on their registration, um, but because of significant field losses, they still fulfill our criteria. Um, and that's decided by the um, optometrist within blind veterans. So it, it looks that, you know, obviously you've reapplied. When we registration say, status can change, can't it? Somebody can't. Yeah. It, isn't that? I know I've had it in the past. I was registered partially sighted and, you know, after recovering from a detached retina, uh, you know, when all said and done and everything, uh, uh, just as I was discharged, the uh, check uh, uh, because Pip was coming up at the time, he, he re-registered me as severe sight impaired. You know. So, Alison, on that note then, because you can go up and down, because mm. you can temporarily be severely sight impaired, and then your status would change again and put you back to sight impaired. So how, how would somebody go about that then if, they're, if they get registered as severely sight impaired because they're waiting for something to happen and it's going to be a long-term like six 12 month thing and then you know potentially it it would be reversed to a sight impaired um issue how how would somebody <clears throat> go about that on your books then i think at the point of application with us if you're severely sight impaired you know you you've fulfilled the criteria in terms of your acuities yeah. Um, so you're accepted in the, into the charity because we would hope to start supporting you straight away with with you yeah. know um, whatever your needs are at that time. If then, in, as a result, twelve months later, you know your vision improves in some way. Um, well, that's kind of just an added bonus, really, isn't it? I think it's at the point of application. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fair what enough. your vision just because the the like the very few and far between, like potentially with my eye condition. I could have been registered SSI and then reverted back, but they didn't. Right. They, I am just on the cuff of being registered as SSI. So and it's, you know, even after surgery. So it's, there are people that are in, in that um, situation. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so if someone didn't meet your criteria and they've come to you as the first point of contact, would you then consider referring them back to somebody like ourselves um, and other local sight loss charities to see what they offer because we offer yeah. very similar things listening to what <clears throat> what you do at your centres but we like we cover the whole of Sefton, West Lanx and Lancashire so you know yeah we can have... absolutely yeah we we would do that I mean it's it's rare to be fair um, because a lot of ours come through um, via the ECLO route so it's at the point where they're at a hospital and they've had their, um, the certification or the diagnosis. And if the, the ECLO actually have, asks, have you served? Um, then, you know, we're, we're notified then at that point. But if at that point they're not engaged with other associations and we wasn't able to accept, then, yeah, we would definitely do some signposts. It's, it's, it's vital, isn't it, that we, we do work together to yeah. ensure that we can provide the best for for our service users like Anne she you know she's um, in both camps really so she could be part of your organization but is also an active participant in in the activities that we do um, and things when 
to like pre-lockdown yeah um, fantastic do both if you can or, yeah <laughs> organization and one of the organizers of um a regular little social group in the area that she lives in and mm. things like that on the back of one of our living with sight loss courses which you know for us is an amazing achievement that we've given the, the guys the confidence to go ahead and do that and set themselves up which was which was really nice and i'm hoping um they, they will get that back up and running again when everybody's a bit happier come june oh that's but, uh, brilliant well done yeah it's it's Great. amazing well no better people to run it i suppose you know if you've exactly. been through your journey and yeah fabulous question i know two charities are very similar and that's like similar to what on our we do yeah so it's amazing job to do really um, and um, no so do they do benefit do you fair, fair benefit forms for them as well really and do you help them go back into communities like fair yeah. forms and to communicate with the local council as well we do yes yeah we we, we do all that so we would support and um, fill an application in or or signpost to somebody who's better placed because sometimes um, there's advice bureaus that can complete farms better than perhaps a, um, a member of the community team can because uh, I, I've done them before because I've worked in um, local authority um, and there's an act to them about how things are worded <laughs> and how mm. they're submitted. Mm. So yeah. I, I personally wouldn't have a, a, an issue doing them, but um, in certain circumstances, it might be better to signpost to somebody better place to complete them. But yes, we regularly liaise with local authority, sensory teams, um, with adult social care, with regards to care packages that might be in place. Um, and with care agencies as well on be behalf of, of our members um yeah we do that's all all part of the sort of like the community team's role anything around that person that happens around their home or within their community yeah i think the the thing that that struck me the service that you offer that we don't is that psychological support mm. um and that's that is absolutely invaluable, um, you know, because people are really struggling with coming to terms with sight loss, and especially um, if you've been so active in your in your career, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's it's hard enough when you're maybe retired and things, but if you're an active member and something has happened to you mm. um, and you lose your sight during service, that must be phenomenally yeah, um, difficult to come to terms with yeah and we, we do work yeah. with other veterans agencies as well so we, we have um, yeah we have a number of what we call working age members and um, right. uh, and we have a coordinator who who works with with them and activities well a couple of coordinators who work with them and activities around the working age members and that and that includes getting them back to work and you know as you say looking through that recovery journey and it might not just be vision loss it can include you know physical injury and and um brain injury as well um so we do work with with other veterans charities like help for heroes um is what well, and blesma as well is the limb loss charity so yeah to sort of like coordinate all those services um around the person yeah, because you could still get injured, can't you, in combat now, you know, an active yeah. soldier could yeah. still, you know, there are, we are involved in conflicts, aren't we, even now? We are, less so than we have been in previous years, fortunately, but yes, we are, you can still get injured. And I once had a client, I'm, I'm not mentioning names, when I worked for Action Blind People, we had a client that was uh, had uh, come to Action Blind People for IT services and whatnot. And, you know, like you said, a brain a brain injury came with the with the, the sight loss as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it been attacked in what, what was the first Gulf War, I think it was. Yeah. You know, and the eye had been damaged, but... Uh, not only that, the brain had been damaged as well, which you would if you're getting a blow on, say, the head. Say, the corner of the head or something like that. 
So do you, do you find that you get um, good integration from working aged people? Because it's a, it's a, a project that I work on, um, trying to engage people of working age. I think it's really hard. Yeah, it can be. I mean, it, there's quite a, quite a few working age members are involved in fundraising, and that's got yeah. a kind of an in, you know, of, yeah. of getting within the organisation. So I think that that's something that you know the the coordinators try to do is like, well, you know, if you're able to. I mean, I think at the moment we're doing they're doing a walk Lands End to John O'Groats or a virtual yeah. walk. Anyway, they've worked yeah. out mileage. Oh. I'm sure you're doing similar things. Um, and, and that's an, an inroad. And then there's lots of things going on in terms of working age members groups. So there's different offshoots from that and they have a photography group and a, you know, a, a climbing group, et cetera. Um, I don't know exactly the figures on the take up. I mean, it's something that, you know, if, if you're interested in Jenny, I can put you in touch with, with our working age member coordinator and then perhaps get be able to give you some some information on that yeah um but uh, th those that are participating are very active so that you know that's great that's a really good thing some, some people like to dip in and dip out and some people just love that constant you know activity doing things all the time yeah I think as well being veterans they're used to being active and involved in a routine and hmm. and things so that's potentially a little bit easier to, to get them to focus on the activities that are available because I mean David is a very active member of our get active group and we we have walking groups we um they go bowling they they go climbing the water sports activities all kinds yeah Alison thank you so much it's been really interesting it's been good